God's communication with humanity was intended from the beginning for every nation, tribe, and language. While all languages are equally competent in expressing the message of the Bible, each language has particular and sometimes unique capacities to communicate certain biblical messages in exceptionally enriching ways that other languages cannot. But where can the average person get a window into how other languages communicate God's truth? Today we talk about translation insights and perspectives, also known as TIPS, a free online resource at tips.translation.bible, which provides a growing collection of translation insights in the form of stories so they can be made available to everyone in the church as well as researchers and others. I'm Andrew Case, and this is Working for the Word. So I'm German. I grew up in Germany in a, a Lutheran family that was not really Christian. I mean, we, I, I was baptized and confirmed, but, but never really had anything to do with Christianity aside from sort of formalities, which is, you know, very common in Germany of my era. And I think it's still common today, probably even more so in, in, in a way. That's Dr. Joost Zetsche, the one behind tips.translation.bible. And I started university fairly late. I started when I was 21. I had, you know, I did all kinds of sort of alternative things before that. Lived in, in a circus wagon for a few years without electricity and water. So kind of an alternative lifestyle, but really great. I learned a lot of things, had lots of animals and, and all that. But I started university relatively late and I studied Chinese. And part of the program to study Chinese is to, um, to live in China for a certain time. So I lived in China from 88 to 90. In China, I both met my wife and I became a Christian. I, I had started to study the Bible before, um, even before I went to China. I studied the Bible, you know, during my time in China. And at a certain point, I felt like what I had been studying and reading about doesn't make much sense if I don't apply it. And I became very interested in the Chinese Bible. So all my master's and PhD work was on first a um, linguistic comparison of, of a number of Bible translations, Chinese Bible translations. And my PhD then was on the history of Chinese Bible translation, which was just so interesting. Well, shortly after I finished my PhD thesis, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And that to us felt like was kind of a wrench in the system <laughs> there. We, we, we didn't feel the freedom to, to plan as easygoing as we were before. And we decided we had two children at that point. And so we stayed in the US and um, I became a professional technical translator. And I worked in that field for well, now for 20-some years. Later on, Yost wanted to revisit his interest in Bible translation and published an article in Christianity Today with the provocative title, Why Multiple Translations Might Even Be Better Than Scripture in Its Original Languages. You and I, and I think every Christian, has been um, at church on, on a Sunday listening to sermons, and the pastor at some point says to the congregation, well, you know, We've been talking about this particular verse, um, but really, I think you don't really understand the verse because you don't understand Greek or Hebrew. Let me tell you what the meaning of the Greek and Hebrew of, of that particular verse is. And then he kind of gives the key to the true understanding of that verse. I, I've been thinking about that for a long time and felt that this was wrong because translations whether it's English or Spanish or, you know, any of the 3,000 languages the Bible has been translated into, they have to have some meaning, um, aside from just being a, you know, illustration or something of what the Bible really says. In the article, he writes, I believe that translations of Scripture are not secondary fill-ins, but an integral part 
of the ongoing and primary expression of God's message in written form. Every new rendering of God's word in a linguistic set of human expression, a language, enriches the worldwide church in her understanding of God, regardless of whether we speak that particular language. Our thinking and imagination are necessarily confined and constrained by our own language and its assumptions. But when we encounter another language, and as it confronts and interacts with the biblical text, it can expand our understanding of God and our world. This is true in our dealings with the Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic source texts, yes, but also the more than 2,000 target languages in which the Bible or parts of the Bible have been translated. Here's my dream as a faithful translator sitting in the pew. The next time my pastor expounds on the broader meaning of a biblical term, that foreign-sounding word he draws from may well be Quechua or Navajo or Korean, or any of the more than 2,000 other possibilities, thus drawing me and my fellow worshipers into the ongoing translation process of God's Word. So I, shortly after I, I published that article in Christianity Today, I, I kept on thinking about it, but it, it just didn't let me go. You know, it, I kept on, I, I live in Oregon at the Oregon coast and I take my two dogs out to the beach every day for an hour. I, you know, doing those long walks, I kept on thinking, you know, what, why, why am I not, why doesn't let that let me go? Why, why can I just not just say, you know, this was it and, and let's, let's just continue in the profession that you have. I kept on thinking how powerful it would be to have a tool that would give free access to both Bible translators, but also the general public or the church to look at all those translations. I knew there were a lot of stories out there. Uh, in fact, we, we used to call them stories, now we call them insights. Um, but stories is not a bad word for it. So it's a, you know, it's a story of how a certain language or culture approaches a concept. So he started asking around, and eventually the United Bible Societies caught the vision and agreed to help make his dream a reality. So the site is now available at tips.translation.bible. It's freely accessible to anyone. And it's a site that allows you to look in a number of ways. The way that we are encouraging people is by verse. So you can go um, to the site and say, I'm right now doing my devotion in the morning, Matthew 19 or something. And you can then look up verse by verse For every verse, sometimes you find one or two, sometimes you find 15 different articles on how a certain word or a phrase or a concept, sometimes even a grammatical concept in other languages has an impact on how how, how the translation is being done. And of course, for Bible translators who are working in the field, um, there are many tools that Bible translators have, but there is no tool such as that. There was a time in the 50s and 60s and 70s, when Eugene Nida and other giants <laughs> of the of Bible translation wrote a lot of books and handbooks for translators, etc., where they focused quite a bit on examples of what other languages are doing to translate a certain concept. But s- somehow in the like late 70s and early 80s, that was sort of dropped as a way, as a tool for, as a helpful tool for translators. But now, thanks to Yost's vision, we have this free growing collection of 11,700 insights, 11,846 terms, 20,224 verses, and 656 languages represented. And he's constantly looking for more additions. So if you're a translator on the field listening to this, You can head over to tips.translation.bible and get in touch with him to share what you've discovered. And what a great way to bless others outside of the language community where you work. And we are, you know, the the sources that we're using are of a great variety, including some that are sometimes quite critical, in fact, of the, you know, translations that were chosen or of the process that led to a certain translation. And we're not trying to whitewash it. We're just, uh, you know, essentially it's just a collection of data that 
is either given to us or that we find in published materials and we are, without commenting on it, we're just publishing it and um, making it up to the reader to find meaning in it and creative enough to be um, inspired and to be enlarged by it to some degree. One of the things I appreciate about this tool is that it helps translation teams dialogue with others who have gone before and grappled with the same concepts or key terms and other challenges. So to be able to see helpful examples of what others have done and not feel alone in the process is valuable. Let me share some examples from the website. If I go to the search bar and type in priest, it'll give me this. The Greek and Hebrew that is translated as priest of the most high God or priest of God most high in English is translated in binumarian as anaikirafa, go between, between God and men. So that's a kind of a compound word that means altogether go between, a go between, between God and men. Priest is a word that my team continues to struggle with, and this may help them think differently about how they want to translate the term. Right now, they're using a descriptive phrase, which is the one who works in the house of God. Now, another example, if I search the word altar, I see that in Muna, the language Muna, it's translated as an offering table. This is often a foreign concept to many cultures that they have to figure out how to communicate. Now, if you search for the word love to God, specifically so there's love in other contexts, you'll find things like this. The Mitla Zapotec Indians nestled in the mountains of Oaxaca, Mexico, that's my neck of the woods here, describe love in almost opposite words. Instead of putting God into one's own heart, they say, my heart goes away with God. There is a sense in which God dwells within us, but there is also a sense in which our hearts are no longer our own. They belong to him, and the object of affection is not here on earth, but as pilgrims with no certain abiding place, we long for that fuller fellowship of heaven itself. Then it continues, Love may sometimes be described in strong, powerful terms, The Misquitos of the swampy coasts of eastern Nicaragua and Honduras say that love is pain of the heart. There are joys which become so intense that they seem to hurt, and there is love which so dominates the soul that its closest emotion seems to be pain. The Tzotzils, living in the cloud-swept mountains of Chiapas in southern Mexico, describe love in almost the same way as the Misquitos, They say it is to hurt in the heart. And it goes on, the Akatec, Western Kanjobal Indians of northern Guatemala, have gone even a step further. They describe love as, my soul dies. Love is such that without experiencing the joy of union with the object of our love, there is a real sense in which the soul dies. A man who loves God according to the Konob idiom would say, My soul dies for God. This not only describes the powerful emotion felt by the one who loves, but it should imply a related truth, namely that in true love, there is no room for self. The man who loves God must die to self. True love is, of all emotions, the most unselfish for it does not look out for self but for others. False love seeks to possess. True love seeks to be possessed. False love leads to cancerous jealousy. True love leads to a life-giving ministry. In Mairasi, the term that is used for love for God, by God, and for people is the same. Desire one's face. So I just find that kind of stuff really enriching and fascinating, and I hope you do too. Now, this tool also helps for difficult passages, like Genesis 6-4, for instance. And this may not be the best example on the website, but if you look up this verse, then it gives me the Hebrew 
and English on the left side of the page. And on the right, it gives me how some of the phrases within that verse have been translated by different languages. And in this case, it says, the men of renown, that phrase, was translated in Western Lawa as men who are like horns of a barking deer. (laughs) So that's really interesting. Now, righteousness or righteous are other difficult terms that many teams struggle with. On tips, it gives me the option to see different translations in a simplified graphical form, as well as a more detailed article. So this is really neat. So you can look at this graph, you'll just have to go there and see it. But let me read you some of these ways that righteous or righteousness has been translated. The Highland Puebla Nahuatl and the Kekchi and the Muna say to have a straight heart. Now the Kipsigis say to do the truth. The Mesquital Otomi to do according to the truth. The Wautla Masatek say to have truth. The Yine say to fulfill what one should do. In Indonesian, they say people who are true. Navajo, to do just so. Anwak, to do as it should be. And the Mosi, to have a white stomach. Now, I'm sure some of you are waiting for me to bring up the divine name here. So, here we go. One of the most extensive sections of the site covers the divine name. And it's a gold mine of information that I didn't cover in my series on the subject. So, here's something you probably didn't know. In the Chinese Protestant tradition, the transliteration of Jehovah is historically deeply rooted, even though there are some historical burdens. So Yahweh is rendered in the Chinese Union Version, the most widely used Bible translation in China, as well as most other Chinese Bible translations as Yehua. According to Chinese naming conventions, Yehua could be interpreted as Yehua, in which Ye would be the family name and Hua, harmonic and radiant, that's what it means, the given name. In the same manner, Ye would be the family name of Jesus, translated as Yesu, and Su would be the given name. Because in China, the children inherit the family name from the Father, the sonship of Jesus to God the Father, Yehua, would be illustrated through this. Though this line of argumentation sounds theologically unsound, it is indeed used effectively in the Chinese church. Ye, an interrogative particle in classical Chinese with one symbol, is part of the same phonetic series as ye with another symbol, which gives it a certain exchangeability. Ye carries the meaning father, or is used as an honorable form of address. The choice of the first Bible translators to use the transliteration Yehua for Jehovah had a remarkable and sobering influence on the history of the 19th century in China by possibly helping to shape the fatal Taiping ideology, a rebellion that ended up costing an estimated 20 million lives. Dot, dot, dot. If you want to read the rest of how that actually happened and played out, you can go check it out on the website. See, we, we have to believe that those people are loved as much by God as we are, right? As you and I are. Whether they access that love through our language or through their language, we have to believe that God gives them all the tools with their language, just as he gives us all the tools in our language to understand him. And and so we need to take that serious. There's no way but to take it serious. Now, do we always completely understand what those, you know, back translated concepts and terms mean? Probably not. But do they give us good insights and inspirations? I think they have to. They, they do, I think. 
So there is um, in First Timothy, uh, First Thessalonians five three, there is um, Paul talks about um, peace and security. You know, there is that phrase, peace and security. How we translate it in English, anyway. And in a small language in Paraguay, in Enlet, they translated that as no news, because when there is no news. There is peace and security. <laughs> and, you know, in, in especially I actually tweeted about that quite a bit uh, and, and wrote about it in, you know, a number of ways because it seems that especially in our time right now here in America for sure, right, we are bombarded with news and the news often is not very good, right? <laughs> and it's, it's troubling and we, we um, you know, we sometimes voluntarily submit ourselves to, to t way too much news. So it, it served as a great reminder to me and to hopefully others who have read that, you know, no news is sort of an equivalent to peace and security. <laughs> It's a, it's a living project that gives testimony to the living history of, of Bible translation. Um, every uh, month, there is not a month when there is not a number of Bible translations being published for the very first time, as you well know. And any of these will have lots of insights that will help me and you and anyone who can access it Unfortunately, right now, only through English. That's a, that's a whole different problem to start with. But, you know, a, a much greater number of people, certainly, than in the language that the Bible was originally translated for. And, and so this will continue to grow and continue to become, you know, bigger and bigger and bigger. So there you have it. We're living in a time of such an immense wealth of resources, and it's a joy to highlight yet another free one that enriches our understanding of Scripture through the eyes of our brothers and sisters in Christ across borders. Thanks for listening, and for those of you who entered the contest to win a free book by leaving a review on iTunes, some of you didn't email me after leaving the review so that I can let you know if you won. So please go ahead and do that at andrewdcase at gmail.com, which will be in the description. Working for the Word is a podcast where we believe that the Bible is a unified, God-breathed, God-centered, hope-giving book, sweeter than honey, and pointing to Jesus. This podcast exists to help you treasure the Bible more, go deeper into it, and ultimately become like the man of Psalm 1. Psalm 1.